This is Find Your Dream Job, the podcast that helps you get hired, have the career you want, and make a difference in life. I'm your host, Mac Pritchard. I'm also the founder of Max List. It's a job board in the Pacific Northwest that helps professionals find fulfilling careers. I believe that lifelong learning is the key to a successful career. And to get a better job, you need to learn the job hunting skills that will help you find the role of your dreams. That's why we're here today. Every week on Find Your Dream Job, I interview a different career expert. We discuss the tools and tactics you need to find the work you want. This week, I'm talking to Linda Van Valkenburg about what to do if your networking isn't working. You know you need to go to networking events. You think about trying a monthly job club or a happy hour organized by your professional group. But you never make it because you're not sure what to expect or how to make the most of the experience. Our guest today says a networking event isn't different from any business meeting. As with any appointment, there are three key steps in networking. Preparation, execution, and follow-up. Want to learn more? Listen in now at the MaxList studio as I interview Linda Van Valkenburg about what to do if your networking isn't working. Linda Van Valkenburg is a certified executive career coach. She helps her clients plan, manage, and organize individualized career campaigns. Linda is a frequent speaker at networking and professional groups. She's also presented at the Yale School of Management and the University of Connecticut's School of Business. She joins us today from Danbury, Connecticut. Linda, why do people struggle with networking events? Hi, Mac. Thanks for having me. I think, um, you know, struggling with networking events is more common than you might think, be you an extrovert or an introvert. Uh, It it can be uh, quite a lonely thing to walk into a meeting alone where you don't know anyone, uh, to know if you have your act together, your materials together, your value proposition that some people call an elevator speech or a branding proposition, so that the others in the room know how to help you. So, it can be pretty intimidating at first, especially for someone who's going through transition or job search for the first time. Uh, the, The job search market has changed since 2008, and networking has become a major part of that. And so many of us know it, but it doesn't mean we know what to do about it. Well, Linda, can you actually look for a job without going to networking events? Uh, I wouldn't recommend it. I find that networking is one of the strongest arms of a career campaign that you can utilize. And once you do put yourself out there and you break the ice, you see that there are so many other people who are willing to help and know people that you may want to know at a certain company or in a certain industry. So it's really behooves you to go, um, maybe take a friend if it's, if it's that intimidating, but otherwise that horrible expression, you might as well be cutting the nose off your face if you don't go network. Uh, so take a friend, make it a fun event. So Linda, when you talk about networking events, I, there's a popular image out there. It's the airport holiday Inn. not to pick on mm. holiday Inn, but it's that function room with the collapsible walls and the people in the loud clothing who are collecting <laughs> cards. Um, But when you talk about networking events, Linda, that's not what you have in mind. Can you tell us more? Mm -mm. Right. Not at all. Um, There are two kinds of events. Um, There's a structured event. There's an unstructured event. I run structured events here once a month. As a matter of fact, this evening, I'll be conducting one uh, just about 5.30 p.m. And I run a structured event where you have a facilitator who can organize the event call upon each person in the room one at a time to make their presentation so the entire group can hear and help. An unstructured event, to me, feels great. It has its purpose, but it can also feel like a glorified cocktail event if you're just bumping around the room and maybe you run into that person that you were destined to meet who knows someone at a target company you have or Maybe you don't. So I think they both can have their place in your career campaign, but 
when I think of a networking event, I'm thinking of something very professional, something structured, something that has employed as well as those in career search at that event, uh, even using industry association events as a networking event uh, could help. So, yeah, I, I have a bigger plan in mind for clients and prospects when they are beginning to network. So, a little research on your part, either through your Department of Labor or the trade associations that you're connected with, be it a financial executive networking group or the American Marketing Association, etc. You can find groups that are well-structured well attended and have people there that you would want to know. Could you? T- I want to talk about both kinds of events, structured and mm-hmm. unstructured. And you mentioned structured events. You're an, a career coach, and you yeah. run a structured event. Uh, but there are other kinds of structured events out there. That uh, an example that comes to mind for me are, are job clubs. Right. Can, can you give uh, other examples of structured events, Linda, besides job clubs and events that career coaches like you might run? Well, there are groups on um, Meetup um, you might have heard about or Eventbrite. They might advertise some meetings as well, Meetup or Eventbrite. And then, as I mentioned earlier, there are trade shows, I'm sorry, uh, trade associations Uh, for your particular industry. Uh, So I would consider strongly about joining some of those associations so that you can rub elbows with others in your field that may be employed or may be in search or may have a great Rolodex on their LinkedIn profile that could help you. But job clubs, accountability groups, um, there's all sorts of things going on if you're keeping your eyes open, uh, looking at LinkedIn even to join the virtual groups on LinkedIn can be a wonderful place to learn more about what's going on in your area or in your region within your uh, professional field. So there's there's plenty to do if you just keep your eyes on the different groups and LinkedIn has become such a resource for um, finding out information like that. And you mentioned as an example of an unstructured group, uh, uh, perhaps a conference with a, a social hour. Yes. Um, and other examples might include, say, the luncheon program at the chapter of your professional association, too. There's many lunch and learns that happen. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, once you find out, if you contact the facilitator, which I encourage before any type of networking meeting, if you contact the facilitator, they're usually more than glad to have other professionals in the room that can add to that conversation. Okay. Well, you mentioned preparation. Uh, Let's talk about that because I know, having read your articles, that you think uh, effective networking at events has three key elements. You you talk about preparation, execution, and Mm -hmm. follow-up. Uh, what kind of preparation do you recommend? Whether And again, we're talking about both structured and unstructured events. This, exactly. These are things you need to do no matter what kind of event you're going to. Yes. Well, I believe that um, for the average person, and I consider um, uh, myself an average person, I'm not a resume writer, but I sure know how to read them. But for many people in transition, when you see someone else's resume, it doesn't mean you know how to read and pull out the key elements that that person might be trying to communicate. So I'm a believer in putting together a one pager or a networking overview sheet and not use your resume at these events. The one pager would um, certainly give a little bit of your branding statement, but it would also give just a couple of bullets about your expert level skills. It might have a few of your career highlights. And then it's going to have a space for what target companies you're interested in having an introduction to or someone they might know within that company. Um, so a one pager could really be helpful to hand to other member or members that are at that meeting so that they can also use it to write notes on, but have a better understanding in human language versus resume language of what you're looking for and what you're all about. So I I recommend certainly having a one pager ready. Certainly bring your business cards um, and then know what you'd like to offer ahead of that meeting. Would you be offering 
the group or individuals um, a breakfast, um, meeting for breakfast at the local diner, or going out for a coffee or something else post five o'clock when everybody's back home from interviews or a trip into the city, et cetera. So having your materials ready makes you feel confident too when you are passing those materials out at a structured or an unstructured or a job club type of meeting. I'm glad you mentioned the business card. It, it seems like a small thing. And I know I was poking a little fun at the idea of someone passing out business cards at events like this, but it, it's surprising how many people don't bring cards. Mm-hmm. And um, the and it's why is it important to have one to share? Well, I think there's there could be a stigma around that too. If someone's feeling like, well, I don't work for Acme Company anymore, what would I put on a business card? This is an opportunity to show your style. Um, put on your tagline, uh, put something clever on the back of your card that people remember. Uh, with, with great companies like Moo, M-O-O, Moo.com, and Vistaprint, and even Staples, uh, you can get a pack of 500 for $10. I mean, it's something crazy ridiculous, but you can have your personality come out on those cards with your title Maybe some target companies on the back of that card and what you're offering that person. Meet up for a cup of coffee. Here's my phone number. I'm a CFO or I'm a managing director of of content uh, for an advertising agency. Whatever it is, put it on the card and have some fun with it. That's your personality. Okay. Any other materials you recommend people uh, prepare or consider bringing to an event besides that one pager and, and a business card? Well, one thing I've seen on the back of a one pager that I thought was great fun is someone put her grandmother's brownie recipe on the back. And I can tell you that networking paper was still remembered years after that young lady had come to our meeting because it was creative and she was remembered and remembered fondly. I had another gentleman put a picture of a not a real dollar bill, but something he drew and said it was good for uh, one cup of coffee. So when people get creative with their materials, you're well remembered. Uh, people want to reach out to you because you look so approachable and we all end up helping each other. This really, this activity of networking is really about giving before you get. And it's really about people helping people because job search can be a very lonely ordeal. What I also like about the two examples you shared there were, were that those people were offering something that was actually um, useful in addition to the information they were sharing about themselves. I mean, yes. a good yes. recipe is um, <laughs> always welcome. And uh, mm-hmm. the, you know, the, uh, and the, uh, the, the, the photocopy of the dollar it might lead to a cup of coffee is, is valuable as well. Yes. And they're also great conversation starters, aren't they? Absolutely. We all need an icebreaker. And, and with just a little bit of creativity and, and getting out of that comfort zone, we can all help each other. Okay. Well, I want to talk more about what happens when you get to the event, whether it's structured yeah. or unstructured. Let's take a break, Linda. And when mm-hmm. we come back, we'll continue to uh, chat about what to do if your networking isn't working. Great. What do you say when someone asks about your job search goal? Do you talk about a specific job or company? Or do you say, I'm keeping my options open? Here's why I ask. One of the most common reasons job seekers struggle is the lack of a clear job search goal. You might think it makes sense to say yes to anything. But when you try to be all things to all employers, you end up applying everywhere. And that makes for a longer and harder job search. Setting a job search goal is hard but we've got a new free guide that can help. It's called Finding Focus in Your Job Search. Get your copy today. Go to maxlist.org slash focus. We take you step-by-step step through the top questions you need to answer to know what to do in your career and your job search. Go to maxlist.org slash focus. The more you know about what you want, the easier you make it for others to help you. And you'll find your next job faster, too. Go to maxlist.org slash focus. Stop chasing every lead. Get your copy today of Finding Focus in Your Job Search. And now, let's get back to the show.
We're back in the Maxless studio, and I'm talking with Linda Van Valkenburg. She's a certified executive career coach and a frequent speaker at networking and professional groups, and she's joining us today from Danbury, Connecticut. Now, Linda, before the break, we were talking about what to do if your networking isn't working, and we talked about preparation. Uh, Now, let's discuss what happens when you walk into the room. And as you pointed out at the start of our interview, uh, there are two kinds of events here, those more structured ones like a job club, uh, and then unstructured ones, but perhaps a, a social mixer at a professional conference. Take us through both scenarios. What do you recommend that uh, people do when they get out of their car or, or <laughs> step off the elevator and they're about to walk into the event? Well, Mac, I tell you, I'll take a half step back for one second and say before that meeting, structured or unstructured, to contact that meeting facilitator. Because then you can let them know it's your first time. You can see if if you have to wear a certain type of clothing so that you know you don't come in in shorts and deck shoes and everybody else is in suit and tie. You can find out how many people are coming so you know how much material to bring with you um, and find out. Here's the question I love. Is anybody else at the meeting just like me? Is anybody else at the meeting in my field? So that the facilitator, when you do get there and jump off that elevator and you introduce yourself now to the facilitator and remind them, I'm the lady or I'm the gentleman that called you last week about the meeting, that facilitator can now make an instant introduction with you to that other person she or he had in mind. Or if you asked, are there other new people here at the meeting, she or he could introduce you to a group of all the newbies. And isn't that a nice way to get started too? So that's that's one of the first things I wish more of my networkers would do because tonight, for instance, about half the people in my room this evening will be brand new. So I'll be sure to be warming it up for them to help them feel comfortable with the group as they arrive. But if the facilitator isn't used to doing something like that, you can even help your facilitator by reminding them you were the person who called and looking for a quick introduction, someone else who might already be there uh, that is like you. Um, Once you do get in that uh, meeting, the facilitator has maybe passed out some materials, um, maybe a list of everyone who's going to be there tonight. But as you start to talk to people in the room, and now you're into the the meeting space, have some questions ready for other people to help them start a conversation. I believe in having someone else talk first and listen to them and engage with them, and then it's your turn. So this way, the conversation is moving, and it's not monopolized. So things you might want to ask a new person that you're meeting that night is, what brings you here? Is this the first time you've come? Do you keep coming back? What do you do? So there's lots of light and easy, airy questions that you can get someone to feel comfortable to speak with you. Of course, you're concentrating on that and, and that put, puts people at ease, doesn't it? When they, yeah. uh, when, and they're grateful for those questions, aren't they? They are, because they were thought about first, and something inside will click, and they'll know, wait a minute, now it's time for me to ask about you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good. And I love your idea of contacting a facilitator, or uh, whether it's a structured event or a more informal one, the, the organizer ahead of time, because when you walk in the door, you actually know somebody, don't you? Yes. And that's what I think the hesitation can be with so many new networkers. So that would help tremendously. Okay. So you've got a a list of questions. Uh, There's somebody you knew uh, when you walked into the space. And do you recommend people get there early, Linda, uh, right on time? What's your suggestion there? Sure. Well, again, another good reason to call the facilitator because you can find out if they open the doors early and if you can do that so that you can have an unstructured portion to a structured meeting, certainly. But if it is going to be an unstructured meeting where everyone is just um, enjoying each other's company, bumping around the room, you might not have to get there quite so early. Um, But I like to give my folks some unstructured time before the big meeting. And then, of course, after the meeting, there's a lot of milling around because once they've been together for the last two hours through the structure, 
Now they want to have those private conversations off to the side. So the facilitator might have something she or he can share with you so that you know uh, what's best for that particular meeting. What kind of expectations do you recommend the people you work with set for events, uh, whether structured or unstructured? Because often do you find that people go and they say, well, you know, that that was kind of uncomfortable and I'm not sure that I got anything out of it. Well, hopefully there was at least one or two folks um, that they came away with thinking, gee, that's somebody I want to um, uh, get back to. So I, I would hope that that happened. <laughs> um, uh, and certainly you could set up some coffee meetings. But I also know that even at my meetings, from month to month, the chemistry changes. Um, tonight, maybe I have five people that came last month and the balance is brand new or has come on a different month. So I would tell you to return to that meeting because certainly there will be a familiar face in there. You could help someone else who's brand new and help them get around the room and feel comfortable as well. But there's always something you could get out of a meeting if you're open-minded and you're um, going in too with some objectives. You know, what did you want to get out of that meeting? Was it one or two new people? Was it a new target introduction? Go in with some objectives so you can measure on the way out. Did I get many of the things, most of the things, none of the things that I came in for? And what can I do to change that the next time? What suggestions do you have for listeners, Linda, about how to set those objectives? Well, keep them reasonable. Um, go in with your eyes open, ears open, so you can see what is happening at the meeting. Because if you're going in expecting to get a job after the meeting, that's probably a little too high. <laughs> but if you're going in saying, I'm going to get two new leads or connections or market intelligence or ideas for opportunities or new websites to go to, that's very reasonable. That's very reasonable and something that if you ask enough people in the room, I bet you'd exceed your expectations. And if you walk into the room with some specific objections or uh, objectives rather, um, yeah. it's, it's going to help you when you have those conversations, bring them to the point that you want to address, won't it? Truly. Yes. Yeah. Good okay. point, Mac. Yeah. And uh, well, good. So you're you're perhaps in a job club or a facilitated conversation like the one that you lead, and you're meeting uh, other job seekers, and you've got that short list of two or three objectives you want to address, or you've walked into a uh, a function room at a industry conference, and you're circulating. What uh, aside from having those objectives and those questions at hand, what what else do you suggest people do during the course of either event? Uh, remember that it's not just about them. Remember that it's a two-way street and that you're listening to what someone else is in need of and that you're willing to share because isn't that what you're hoping someone will do with you? So I suggest that when it's your turn to listen, truly listen and key in on what that person is asking for. And keep the promise if you say, you know, I think I have someone in my network that might be able to help you. Keep that promise within 24, 48 hours and get back to your new networking friend to say, let me make an introduction on LinkedIn. I found that person I was thinking about. So, remembering this is a two-way street, keeping those networking promises, it really is a lifeline to those in job search. Because it's what we would hope. It's the golden rule. Isn't that what you would want someone to do for you? So be generous, keep your promises, and, and be of service to others. Other suggestions, Linda, about follow-up, either uh, in conversation at the events or after you go home? Yes. Um, I like to keep a list of maybe the two or three gems, if I'm in job search, the two or three gems that I met at a particular meeting. And about 30 days later, if I'm keeping an Excel spreadsheet, and I think every job seeker keeps an Excel spreadsheet, mine tend to have lots of tabs across the bottom, you know, between the job sites I'm using or the active targets I'm going after or the networking groups I'm attending. But then I have my clients keep a networker tab listing the different people they've met that they want to keep in touch with from these groups. 
And I suggest that at least every 30 days, reach back out, maybe two, three, four a week, just a little email, a text message, a message on LinkedIn, something that says, hey, George, thinking of you, hope that interview went well last week. Because isn't it nice to know we're not going through this alone? It's a big difference, doesn't it? It does. It really does. It keeps your high hopes. It keeps you buoyant. It keeps you waking up every morning and doing it again. (laughs) Well, it's been a terrific conversation, Linda. Now, tell us what's next for you. Oh, thanks, Mac. Well, I'd like to offer something to your uh, great listeners. Um, I've been mentioning a one-page overview sheet today uh, versus giving out that resume. And if listeners would like, I'd be happy to share it if you would email me at Linda at myexecutivecareercoach.com. And if in the subject line you put Max List, I'm happy to send you a sample of what my version of a one-pager looks like. Well, that's a very generous offer. I know you have other resources uh, available on your website, and people can uh, you access those and learn more about you and your company by visiting sure. myexecutivecareercoach.com. Well, Linda, given all the advice you've shared today, what's the one thing you want listeners to remember when their networking isn't working? That you're not alone. That reach out to people, reach out to facilitators, try a new group, contact an old friend, but don't think you have to go through this alone. Okay. Well, thank you, Linda. I really appreciate you being on the show. Oh, I was so happy to be here, Mac. Thank you so much. Take care. talk to job seekers who are nervous about attending networking events, and I ask them a few questions, usually what I learn is this. They're not sure what to do when they walk into that event. And in our conversation today with Linda, she laid out an excellent roadmap for not only how to prepare, but for what to do when you're at the event and how to follow up. So it was a good step-by-step program, and I I think that it's going to be invaluable for you all who are getting ready for your next networking event. Speaking of taking steps, the number one first step you need to take in any job search is being clear about what you want. you got to have that focus because without it, you could attend networking events in all kinds of fields, but you need to focus on the field where you want to be. If you're struggling with finding that focus in your job search, we've got a guide that can help. It's free, and it's called Finding Focus in Your Job Search. Go to our website, Visit maxlist.org slash focus and get your own copy today. It's a free step-by-step guide to setting goals. maxlist.org slash focus. Well, thanks for listening to today's episode of Find Your Dream Job. And join us next Wednesday. Our guest expert will be Lisa Gates. She'll explain how to respond to a lowball salary offer. Until next time, thanks for letting us help you find your dream job.